Hello, friends. Thank you for joining our study. Uh, we will look at authoritative texts. Uh, of course, any comments are my personal interpretation. For any official or authoritative Baha'i teachings, please visit baha'i.org. Uh, I'd like to thank the Baha'i administration, as well as all of those working for peace. Uh, in the description below, you'll find timestamps of the various sections in this video, so you can jump to those sections if you like. Uh, there's also a link to download an audio form of this presentation, as well as a PDF with all of the quotes. Uh, so today we're going to be looking at one of the principles of the Baha'i Faith, which is the non-involvement in political affairs of the Baha'is themselves. The way this is often looked at uh, can cause confusion. One from those outside the Baha'i Faith uh, can often see our non-involvement in politics as if we're holding aloof from the problems of our country and the problems of our world. At the same time, we often will state the Baha'i Faith is completely non-political in character, which itself can cause confusion. Uh, from my own perspective, again, as with all of these presentations, um, it is peculiar to call the Baha'i Faith non-political, especially because the Baha'i teachings itself, when we really look at them, have an economic theory. It actually has a theory regarding how elections should be run. It has regional politics, local politics, national politics, international politics. It has uh, teachings on global security and regional security. It has issues regarding trade. So there is one way in which the Baha'i Faith is very non-political um, in its engagement with partisan politics, as we shall see, but at the same time it's also very political in the sense of how it sees we should be ordering society governing it, um, and that is the very lead, the definition of politics itself. So we're just going to look at a quick quote from uh, the Universal House of Justice. Clearly the establishment of the Kingdom of God on earth is a political enterprise. And the teachings of the faith are filled with political principles. Using the word in the sense of the science of government and the organization of human society. At the same time the Baha'i world community repeatedly and emphatically denies being a political organization. And Baha'is are required, on pain of deprivation of their administrative rights, to refrain from becoming involved in political matters, and from taking sides in political disputes. In other words, the Baha'is are following a completely different path from that usually followed by those who wish to reform society. They eschew political methods towards the achievement of their aims, and concentrate on revitalizing the hearts, minds, and behavior of people, and on presenting a working model as evidence of the reality and practicality of the way of the life they propound." Uh, this is an exquisite quote, <laughs> um, because it, here the Universal House of Justice, in this letter of 1995, is acknowledging that yes, the Baha'i Faith is, ex is extremely political from one conception of how we order society, the science of government itself, but at the same time, uh, as it quotes, on the deprivation of voting rights. So a Baha'i who begins engaging in the political affairs of partisan politics, campaigning for a political party, speaking out against their, the ruling elected party of their government, can, in an extreme case, actually have their own voting rights within the Baha'i administration removed. I love how it says we're following a completely different path. Part of that is by offering a working model as to how politics could actually be run, right? And it's really because we're not going out and campaigning, we're not going out and trying to put pressure upon governments for them to change their policies to accord with our own. We are simply trying to organize our own political affairs within the Baha'i community, using an electoral process that we will see in the future is radically different from that which we normally see or have ever seen in the world and then offering that as a potential model of a way of life, of a way of interacting on the social level, a political level. So in essence, we are the most political, non-political movement <laughs> that uh, I've ever seen, because the teachings of the Baha'i Faith compared to those of Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, etc., incorporate far, far more teachings on how to organize a political system than any prior movement. Uh, this section I just titled Part 1, What is the Problem? Um, Non-political, how far does this go? And what is the effect? So uh, many of the quotes we're actually using here are 
like smaller sections of larger quotes, um, because the original database of quotes is actually quite large. So we're at times you'll see the dot 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 within the quotes where I've taken a section out just for clarity and to not overload the reader or the viewer. So this first quote is from Shoni Effendi. Pronouncement on any current system of politics connected with any government must be shunned. Refuse to commit ourselves to any statement which may be interpreted as being sympathetic or antagonistic to any existing political organization or philosophy. The attitude, one of complete aloofness. Again from Shoghi Effendi. For whereas the friends should obey the government under which they live, even at the risk of sacrificing all their administrative affairs and interests, should the authorities decide today to prevent the Baha'is from holding any meeting or publishing any literature, they should obey. In matters of belief, however, no compromise, whatever, should be allowed, even though the outcome of it be death or expulsion. First of all, in this first quote we're looking at, it says that committing ourselves to any statement interpreted either as being sympathetic or antagonistic. Uh, often there's a misunderstanding that you know we can speak of someone as being a wonderful uh, leader, or a wonderful ruler, or that this party is really good, we just can't speak ill of them. Um, the Guardian in this case is actually stating no, it's sympathetic or antagonistic, they actually have to be put aside. Uh, it is a state of being complete aloofness, that at the same time, whatever power is ruling the country, the principle of obedience to government, which is a central tenet of the Baha'i teachings, goes to such an extent that even if that government comes to the Baha'i community, no matter how large it is, we will see, and actually tells the Baha'is to shut down their, their own administrative system, stop publishing literature, and stop having meetings, which has happened in the past and currently abides in certain countries, um, we actually have to obey immediately and will actually completely dismantle the Baha'i administration. So not antagonistic, not sympathetic, neither of those, at the same time complete obedience to the government itself. Uh, another aspect of this that I find often is misunderstood, this because the principle of the Baha'i teachings is against any partisan politics, seeing as siding with one party over another, at times people think, well, this issue is outside my own country therefore I can comment on it. But again, it's any, ex any existing system, any leader sympathetic or antagonistic. Uh, so there's another quote from the Universal House of Justice, and it is about permissible activities of the Baha'is in relation towards governments. As the faith emerges from obscurity, the application of certain aspects of this policy will require the clarification of the House of Justice. With the passage of time, practices in the political realm will definitely undergo the profound changes anticipated in the Baha'i writings. As a consequence, what we understand now of the policy of non-involvement in politics will also undergo a change. A correct understanding of what is legitimate Baha'i action in the face of the policy of non-interference with government affairs is bound to be difficult to achieve on the part of individual friends. It continues. Hence it is important that decisions as to the conduct of such relationships be made by authorized institutions of the faith and not by individuals. Given the utter complexity of human affairs with which the Baha'i community must increasingly cope, both spiritually and practically, individual judgment is not sufficient. So often the question arises uh, by Baha'is as to what we should do in individual instances, or major political uprising, or major political affairs, and the Universal House of Justice here in 1997 is actually answering that principle, which is um, when it comes to many of these issues, it is up to the institutions of the faith to actually direct the believers and to respond to these. This is why the Baha'i Administrative Order has an Office of Governmental Affairs. Uh, again from the Universal House of Justice. It is perfectly in order for Baha'i institutions to present the Baha'i view or recommendations on any subject of vital interest to the faith, which is under the consideration of a government. 
if the governmental authority itself invites such a submission, or if it is open to receive recommendations. The Baha'i Assembly should, however, refrain from bringing pressure to bear on the authorities in such matters. So this is again a relationship of the administrative order to governments when governments themselves are asking for insights or perspectives on how to address a certain social issue. It's being carried out by the National Spiritual Assembly, for example, and their Office of Governmental Affairs, and at the same time those assemblies cannot bring political pressure to bear upon the government that is even making the request. We're going to see this theme over and over and over, that the Baha'i Faith itself has to be seen to be a belief system and an organization that is freely chosen by individuals without any political pressure being put on any government or people. There is a question that regularly arises when looking at non-involvement in politics, and it's an understandable one, which is, if this is the case, why is it that the Baha'i administrative order and Baha'i communities will question the practices of the persecution of Baha'is in Iran? Uh, for the time being, because it is a very particular case, that we will have to look at it at another time or in a different section. The following two mini-quotes from quotes are just addressing political action and partisan political action on behalf of the Friends. Uh, one small snippet of a quote is, Since such an action brings about disastrous results and ends in hurting the cause and its intimate friends, this was from Shoghi Effendi, or matters political and partisan in character, would eventually lead to entanglements that would, pr that would be not only futile but positively harmful. So that by us engaging in political issues, by us speaking out on behalf of some uh, government organization or party, or against them, that we can actually entangle ourselves in political issues that actually can cause disastrous results to the Baha'i community, but not only them, those who are their friends and supporters. So this next section I uh, just called the Unity Principle, and this quote is actually from um, the New Testament, the Christian Gospels. Uh, in particular from the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus knew their thoughts, and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. I use this to start the unity principle because it's the fundamental premise behind the perspective, in my understanding, of non-involvement in politics. Why? because we cannot be a house that is divided against itself, that ends up becoming entangled in partisan politics, causing division within a movement whose fundamental purpose is actually to bring unity to humankind. We are not the ones to judge our government as just or unjust. For each believer would be sure to hold a different viewpoint, and within our own Baha'i fold a hotbed of dissension would spring up and destroy our unity. We cannot change them through becoming involved. On the contrary, they will destroy us. The second quote. We Baha'is are one the world over, and we are seeking to build up a new world order, divine in origin. How can we do this if every Baha'i is a member of a different political party? Some of them diametrically opposed to each other. Where is our unity then? We would be divided because of politics, against ourselves, and this is the opposite of our purpose. Obviously, if one Baha'i in Austria is given freedom to choose a political party and join it, however good its aims may be, another Baha'i in Japan, or America, or India, has the right to do the same thing, and he might belong to a party, the very opposite in principle, to that which the Austrian Baha'i belongs. Where would be the unity of the Baha'i faith then, or of the faith then? These two spiritual brothers would be working against each other because of their political affiliations. This is the heart of the principle. If we're actually within a specific government, and say one is a conservative and one is a reform, or one is a liberal and one's a republican, one's a democrat, then we end up having a system in which the Baha'i faith, whose fundamental purpose is actually to bring unity by rising above the factionalism and dissensions inherent in current political systems, end up having, say, two Baha'is or large groups of Baha'is who are working against each other at a national level, when their entire purpose is actually to bring unity at a national level. The other example is that The Guardian here is giving is where you have a 
say a Baha'i in Austria whose policies end up being diametrically opposed to those in Japan. So you start bringing in nationalistic and ethnic prejudices or biases, which begin to eat at the very heart of the fundamental purpose of the Baha'i faith, which is unity. This is why often when I'm asked specifically say on a policy of the British Prime Minister, or what I think of the, say for example, the President of the United States, generally when I'm asked I say, well, they are the democratically, legitimately democratically elected leader of the government, right? And as a Baha'i who does not involve himself in nonpartisan politics, I support the will of the people within my nation or any other nation therein. Another quote from Shoghi Effendi from the World Order of Baha'u'llah. How can a faith, it shall moreover be born in mine, whose divinely ordained institutions have been established within the jurisdiction of no less than forty different countries? the policies and interests of whose governments are continually clashing and going, growing more complex and confused every day. How can such a faith, by allowing its adherents, whether individually or through its organized councils, to meddle in political activities, succeed in preserving the integrity of its teachings and in safeguarding the unity of its followers? How can it ensure the vigorous, the uninterrupted, and peaceful development of its expanding institutions? How can a faith whose ramifications have brought it into contact with mutually incompatible religious systems, sects, and confessions be in a position, if it permits its adherents to subscribe to obsolescent observances and doctrines, to claim the unconditional allegiance of those whom it is striving to incorporate into its divinely appointed system? How can it avoid the constant friction, the misunderstandings and controversies, which formal affiliation, as distinct from association, must inevitably engender? Uh, it's important to note that actually this letter itself, um, the World Order of Baha'u'llah by Shoghi Effendi, the Guardian of the Baha'i Faith, was actually written in 1936. We were coming up to the eve of the Second World War, where factionalism, where battles among contending nations is actually becoming just it's just boiling. And here it's telling us that in order to actually preserve the integrity of the teachings, right, and be able to command the allegiance of the Baha'is themselves, they have to stay out of political issues. Why? Because not only are we not trying to become divided amongst ourselves, but the point being made here at the time, 40 different countries, now almost every country on the planet, the Baha'i Faith's administration, our communities, are within these respective governments. How can we maintain peaceful coexistence with the governments under which we are living and abiding and working, and ensure that they know that we are actually not against the government, if we're suddenly then speaking out and jumping all over political affairs and political issues that cross national boundaries? This is especially important in a day when we actually have social media. When the idea of the non-interference in political issues, the non-partisan nature of the Baha'i Faith, is actually global with any typing on social media. We have to be able to represent ourselves as being above and beyond and aloof from these political issues, and that becomes extremely difficult when you actually have documented uh, internet evidence of individuals doing the opposite. So once again, it's very important to be well-wishers of our government, respect the national the choice of the democratically elected people within whatever government we reside, and leave in the hands of the Baha'i administration any pronouncement on political affairs, if that is actually being requested by the government themselves. Of course it's important to recognize that there are many nations wherein the leader is either not democratically elected, uh, or is at times pseudo-elected, not a genuine and true representation of the will of the people. At the same time, we are still asked not to actually pronounce against the government under which we abide, which would lead us to be meddling in their political affairs, and would again entangle us internally and externally with issues. Uh, we have to remember that the Baha'i Faith itself, for long periods of its existence, has actually existed under monarchs, under military leaders, 
Once again, what are we trying to do? We're trying to erect a divinely appointed order that is trying to build a new way of dealing with political affairs to be offered as a model. The very nature of actually building up the Baha'i system and more deeply understanding it as best we can is our answer to the political problems of our world. Again from the World Order of Baha'u'llah. It starts in the middle of a sentence. <laughs> Make it absolutely essential for all those who are the declared members of any one of these communities to avoid any action that might, by arousing the suspicion or exciting the antagonism of any one government, involve their brethren in fresh persecutions or complicate the nature of their task. How else, might I ask, could such a far-flung faith which transcends political and social boundaries, which includes within its pale so great a variety of races and nations, which will have to rely increasingly as it forges ahead, on the goodwill and support of the diversified and contending governments of the earth. How else could such a faith succeed in preserving its unity, in safeguarding its interests, and ensuring the steady and peaceful development of its institutions?" It's in this context that I find it disturbing at times that individual Baha'is, not guided by, guided by the administration itself, start making, for example, anti-Iranian uh, government statements on social media that is not being guided by the institutions themselves, because they can involve our brothers and sisters in fresh waves of persecution. And here we're told that we have to rely on the goodwill and support of the governments under which we are developing the Baha'i model to be offered as an answer to the world problems. And we note here it actually says the peaceful development of our institutions. This is why we're trying to step outside the fray, be outside the political battles, to show a way of organizing society that is not intrinsically divisive, that is not intrinsically antagonistic and or factionalist. And this is just such a vital principle of the Baha'i teachings on this. Let them affirm their unyielding determination to stand firmly and unreservedly for the way of Baha'u'llah to avoid the entanglements and bickerings inseparable from the pursuits of the politician, and to become worthy agencies of that divine polity which incarnates God's immutable purpose for all men. The second quote is from the Universals of Justice. Moreover, when considering whether or not it is wise to make such a submission on any particular matter, the Baha'i Assembly concerned must ensure that it does not by any minute and detailed analysis of a situation needlessly alienate or estrange any government or people, nor involve the faith in the base clamorings and contentions of warring sects, factions, and nations. In order to avoid the entanglements and bickerings, we have to stand, we have to stand unreservedly for the way of Baha'u'llah, to truly be congruent with what we believe, and even the Baha'i administration itself is to avoid antagonizing any government, faction, or political system. The following quote is from the Universal House of Justice in 2003. You state that there are large-scale demonstrations, and you inquire about the appropriateness of Baha'is participating in demonstrations for peace. While these activities are generally carried out in the name of peace, such occasions are motivated by highly political and controversial sentiments at a time of turmoil and confusion in the world. It continues, to become associated with such activities, it could also be harmful to the interests of the faith internationally. And again continues, as you can no doubt understand, Baha'i participation in public demonstrations involving controversial issues would undermine the faith's essential purpose of promoting unity in all aspects of human affairs. This brings up this issue, again, of Baha'is being seen at times as actually not caring. Um, this is a concern that has been raised to me personally multiple times by friends, both within the faith and out outside. Because here it's talking about large-scale demonstrations that actually seem to be about peace, yet at the same time are being motivated by highly political sentiments, and the representation of the Baha'i community within such demonstrations can harm the interests of the faith internationally, because while they might on the surface be actually representing merely as a peaceful pro uh, protest, towards the principle of peace, they have as their focus, if you will, the denouncing of certain political parties, certain political figures, and certain nations explicitly. 
The next quote is from Shoghi Effendi. They are neither for nor against any system of politics. They prefer not to get entangled in political affairs, and to be misinterpreted and misunderstood by their countrymen. In this case, especially when we're considering such things as peaceful, like peaceful protests right, or anti-war protests, that given that we're neither for nor against any system of politics, and we're not going to actually speak out on behalf or against any system or any leader, by involving ourselves in such protests, such campaigns, without the guidance of the Baha'i administration, we can actually be misinterpreted, and suddenly be seen as something that we are not. By our actions we misrepresent the Baha'i Faith itself. Another quote from The Guardian, and it's uh, regarding the bearing on controversial and political issues of the day, and it's talking about any minute and detailed analysis of subjects in the forefront of general discussion. It says that it would often be misconstrued in certain quarters, and give rise to suspicions and misunderstandings that would react unfavorably on the cause. It continues, it would create a misconception of the real object, the true mission, and the fundamental character of the Baha'i Faith. It again continues, ensure that no direct reference or particular criticisms in our exposition of the fundamentals of the faith would tend to antagonize any existing institution, or help to identify a purely spiritual movement with the base clamorings and contentions of warring sects, factions, and nations. And again, while refusing to utter the word that would needlessly alienate or estrange any individual, government, or people, we should fearlessly and unhesitatingly uphold and assert in their entirety such truths, the knowledge of which we believe is vitally and urgently needed for the good and betterment of mankind. Once again, we can highly misconstrue what the Baha'i Faith is actually teaching by our analysis of existing issues, political institutions, and parties. But at the same time we should be furiously and unhesitatingly standing up for what we believe would actually be the solution. Um, how can we do this? Well, We were just previously told in a quote to stand unreservedly for the way of Baha'u'llah. What is that way? To ourselves build up a Baha'i institutions for a model for society, and propose the teachings of Baha'u'llah on collective security, on the way we can organize society, and just saying, well, I am a Baha'i, I actually believe this is the teachings of Baha'u'llah which are the solutions for the world, and such things can be stated by not getting into a debate regarding issues that are actually becoming highly, highly contentious within our world order, globally really. So another section, no political vision in line with the Baha'i Faith. There is no political party in existence whose platform we wholly agree, and we must abstain from membership in such parties. Likewise, people who join the faith must have the courage and conviction to leave their political affiliations behind. The next is from the Universal House of Justice. The Baha'i Commonwealth of the future, of which this vast administrative order is the sole framework, is both in theory and practice not only unique in the entire history of political institutions, but can find no parallel in the annals of any of the world's recognized religious systems. No form of democratic government, no system of autocracy or of dictatorship, whether monarchical or republican, no intermediary scheme of a purely aristocratic order, nor even any of the recognized types of theocracy. None of these can be identified, or be said to conform with the administrative order which the master hand of its perfect architect has fashioned." So not only is there no political party uh, whose vision or conceptions actually is in line with what the Baha'i Faith actually teaches, there is no current existing form of government that actually is identical to it. And this is again about this principle of standing unreservedly for the way of Baha'u'llah. Because if we actually believe that the true way to solve the world's problems is a reordering of a way of life, of a different way to organize society, we're being asked to stand for that way. We're being asked to represent a new way of fashioning society. 
This next quote actually starts out talking about religious affiliation. And as the quote continues, it actually switches to political affiliation and gives us another understanding of why we can't actually be involved within political parties, factions, or institutions. Uh, this is actually from Shoghi Effendi. We as Baha'is must not have any political affiliations with churches or political parties. We as Baha'is can never be known as hypocrites or as people insincere in their protestations. And because of this, we cannot subscribe to both the faith of Baha'u'llah and ordinary church dogma. The churches are waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. We believe he has come again. The churches teach doctrines, various ones and various creeds, which we as Baha'is do not accept. It continues, In other words, there is no Christian church today whose dogmas we as Baha'is can truthfully say we accept in their entirety. Therefore, to remain a member of the Church is not proper for us, for we do so under false pretenses. It then ends this quote, Very much the same reasons motivate us in withdrawing from all political movements, however close some of their ideals may be to our own. In this case, both within the religious world and within the political world. If we come across through affiliation and full association, with any church or political institution, we are in some sense being hypocritical. We're pretending on the surface as if we're truly part of this community or truly part of this party, but at the same time we don't actually agree with all of the dogmas, all of the concepts, or all of the programs of that group. And I would propose this actually would create in itself the phrase what we call a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Because when suddenly someone understands or comes to realize that previously they believed that you were fully on their side, fully behind the party, fully behind this political institution and its programs, they suddenly realize that's not what you're actually doing. Whether that be in the church or a political institution, suddenly suspicion can arise. Well, what have they been doing? Why have they been pretending that they're fully with us, when actually there are various aspects of what we believe that they don't really agree? This leads, obviously, to a conception of hypocrisy, but also suspicion itself. So this would be improper for us to do, because it's false pretense. And again, we've seen that we're not supposed to be bringing any political pressure to bear on governments in a way that is not really done within our world. We're trying to stand us, uh, aside or aloof, stay aloof from this issue of lobbying governments and putting pressure. But what is the perception going to be if suddenly we are part of these institutions, forwarding these programs, part of these churches in the example, and then suddenly the person realized that's actually not what's really going on. The, the aspect of us actually bringing pressure to bear now seems to be happening, is both hypocritical and then can be seen to be clandestine. It should be unmistakably clear that such an attitude implies neither the slightest indifference to the cause and interests of their own countrymen, or of their own country. It indicates the desire cherished by every true and loyal follower of Baha'u'llah to serve in an unselfish, unostentatious, and patriotic fashion the highest interests of the country to which he belongs, and in a way that would entail no departure from the high standards of integrity and truthfulness associated with the teachings of his faith." This is really truly related to the issue that often comes up um, in people's perspective of Baha'is standing aloof from politics. Friends and family in the past have interpreted my non-engagement within political disputes as if I don't care. And I love this quote because it's actually trying to communicate, no, it's far from indifference. It's actually far from not caring of the problems of one's countrymen, or of the globe itself. Rather, it's actually that I believe, personally, that this is the best way to serve my country. The best way to serve my countrymen, and the best way to serve the world. That actually is what has to be communicated to people. Because oftentimes people think that the way they are serving, their country, or their people, or the globe, is not only the best way, but the only way. Uh, so really in this sense we stand 
on a par with people. No, we actually believe this is the best way to actually solve the problems. That's why we have to stand, again, unreservedly for the way of Baha'u'llah and rear his divine polity. So we've previously looked at the principle where we ourselves should not be trying to sway political favor or put pressure upon governments, but there's also a principle which is that we need to be aloof from politics for the purpose of ourselves not being politically swayed or not being seen as being able to be politically swayed. This is the study we're going to start now. Theirs is the duty to demonstrate on one hand the non-political character of their faith, and to assert on the other their unqualified loyalty and obedience to whatever is the considered judgment of their respective governments. The quote continues, and actually the subheading is from the Guardian, the divine polity. Let them refrain from associating themselves, whether by word or by deed, with the political pursuits of their respective nations, with the policies of their governments, and the schemes and programs of parties and factions. In such controversies they should assign no blame, take no side, further no design, and identify themselves with no system prejudicial to the best interests of that worldwide fellowship which it is their aim to guard and foster. Let them beware lest they allow themselves to become the tools of unscrupulous politicians, or to be entrapped by the treacherous devices of the plotters and perfidious amongst their countrymen. Let them so shape their lives and regulate their conduct that no charge of secrecy, of fraud, of bribery, or of intimidation may, however ill-founded, be brought against them. The Baha'i teachings, um, and it needs to be stressed over and over again, and will have to be stressed and communicated to the respective governments of the world, that we have unqualified loyalty and obedience to our government who is ever ruling it. In addition to that, we actually have to stand apart from the machinations of politicians themselves. We cannot be seen as being a tool for the forwarding of the goals and aims of any one party, faction, or government. We actually have to have this worldwide fellowship in our hearts and minds to create a different way to order society, a different way to present to the world as a means to unify the globe politically. We cannot in the end have any charges of secrecy, of fraud, of bribery, in any way, shape, or form, however ill-founded, the Guardian says, be brought against us. How can we do that if we ourselves are campaigning, protesting, engaging in actual statements of a political nature in whatever form of media we can find against either our own government, a party within our government, or another government of another nation within the world? The only way we can do this is once again to focus on the Baha'i administration peacefully developing it with the respect and good favor of the governments under which we abide. There is no other way. A good example of this principle of not being able to be actually associated with secrecy or fraud or bribery is actually a principle within the Baha'i teachings that we cannot accept money from outside. Everything that is done by the Baha'is has to be reared and sustained by the actual membership of the faith. Now there's a case when uh, the city of Haifa in Israel offered to help pay for some aspects of the upkeep of the world center, and the Baha'i world center of course, in following the teachings of Baha'u'llah, had to say no. We cannot do this because, again, then there can be strings tied to actually money given, or it can even seem as if we are being bribed or swayed by politicians. Such an attitude, however, is not dictated by considerations of selfish expediency, but is actuated first and foremost by the broad principle the followers of Baha'u'llah will, under no circumstances, suffer themselves to be involved, whether as individuals or in their collective capacities, in matters that would entail the slightest departure from the fundamental verities and ideals of their faith. Let their words proclaim, and their conduct testify, that they who follow Baha'u'llah in whatever land they reside are actuated by no selfish ambition, that they neither thirst for power nor mind any wave of unpopularity, of distrust, or criticism which a strict adherence to their standards might provoke. The Guardian here is saying that obviously the Baha'i aloofness from partisan politics and the controversies and factionalism 
of our world is not actuated by selfish desire. We're not trying to stay out of the fray or stay out of the process of actually trying to build a better civilization. That's the fundamental purpose of the Baha'i Faith and all of its adherents. But also that we're not actually trying to actually gain power or force the government to actually do what we wish, which would cause distrust. And even the unpopularity of our positions or the distrust and criticism that we actually have which our strict adherence to our principles might provoke, can even in itself not sway us into actually being embroiled in the challenges that our world is facing. This following quote was written in 1933, and it's from this decisive hour, the letters of the Guardian. The handling of this delicate and vital problem regarding non-participation by Baha'is of East and West in political affairs calls for the utmost circumspection, tact, patience, and vigilance. It continues. The misgivings and apprehensions of individual Baha'i should be allayed and eventually completely dispelled. Any misconception of the sane and genuine patriotism that animates every Baha'i heart, if it ever obscures or perplexes the mind of responsible government officials, should be instantly and courageously dissipated. Any deliberate misrepresentation by the enemies of the cause of God, of the aims, the tenets, and methods of the administrators of the faith of Baha'u'llah should be vigorously faced, and its fallacy pitilessly exposed. The cause to which we belong stands on the threshold of an era of unprecedented expansion. It problems, its problems are many, diverse, and challenging. Our methods and ways of approach must likewise be characterized by unusual sagacity, consummate skill, and wisdom. So here the Guardian is recognizing the many individual Baha'is themselves might have apprehensions about the principle of non-involvement in politics, but that these should be allayed and eventually dispelled. In addition, the governments under which the Baha'is operate, by their good grace, can at times and will at times have a misunderstanding of what the Baha'i Faith is actually teaching and how it's actually trying to proceed. These misgivings themselves actually have to be addressed, faced, and openly uh, considered. Um, as well, individuals can, have, and will misrepresent the tenets, misrepresent our goals, and the actual policy in this case of non-involvement to politics. These actually have to be shown to be completely untrue. How is that to be done unless we are increasingly as individuals and collectively coming to have a better understanding of what the Baha'i Faith teaches on this subject itself? So we actually have to have consummate skill and wisdom, a capacity that we have to develop as a community by understanding the world order and its relationship to the outer world. So this next section, uh, our focus. What is our focus? The why, the what, and the how. Why are we having this focus? What are we doing and how are we supposed to proceed? This first quote is actually uh, called The Impotence of Statesmanship and is again uh, from the writings of the Guardian. Dearly beloved friends, humanity, whether viewed in the light of man's individual conduct or in the existing relationships between organized communities and nations, has alas strayed too far and suffered too great a decline to be redeemed through the unaided efforts of the best among its recognized rulers and statesmen. However disinterested their motives, however concerted their action, however unsparing in their zeal and devotion to its cause, no scheme which the calculations of the highest statesmanship may yet devise, no doctrine which the most distinguished exponents of economic theory may hope to advance, no principle which the most ardent of moralists may strive to inculcate can provide in the last resort adequate foundations upon which the future of a distracted world can be built. No appeal for mutual tolerance which the worldly wise might raise, however compelling and insistent, can calm its passions or help restore its vigor. Nor would any general scheme of mere organized international corporation, cooperation in whatever sphere of human activity, however ingenious in conception, or extensive in scope, succeed in removing the root cause of the evil that has so rudely upset the equilibrium of present-day society." This quote is uh, extremely intense, 
Um, and it's important to note several features of it. One is it, it's recognizing that there are people with very, very good intentions. And there are. In all governments there are people who are trying to do the best that they can with zeal and passion and even wisdom, trying to make the world a better place. Often we have a very negative conception of all politicians. And we have to understand that there really are good people trying hard. At the same time, however disinterested their motives, no matter the passion they have or the zeal they have can provide in the last resort, the means to fix the problems of a global order that we're trying to address with tools that cannot fix it. This is why Shoghi Effendi is calling this, this, this section the impotence of statesmanship. As Baha'is, we believe that the current system itself is fundamentally flawed and cannot address the problems of a global society and carry it forward into the future. Let's read the rest of the quote. Nor even I venture to assert, with the very act of devising the machinery required for the political and economic unification of the world, a principle that has been increasingly advocated in recent times, providing itself the antidote against the poison that is steadily undermining the vigor of organized peoples and nations. What else might we not confidently affirm but the unreserved acceptance of the divine program enunciated with such simplicity and force as far back as 60 years ago by Baha'u'llah, embodying in essentials God's divinely appointed scheme for the unification of mankind in this age, coupled with an indomitable conviction in the unfailing efficacy of each and all of its provisions, is eventually capable of withstanding the forces of internal disintegration which, if unchecked, must needs continue to eat into the vitals of a despairing society. It is towards this goal, the goal of a new world order, divine in origin, all-embracing in scope, equitable in principle, challenging in its features, that a harassed humanity must strive." Once again this quote is very intense, but is addressing an issue that whether or not, say, the viewer or the reader actually themselves believes in the program put forward by Baha'u'llah, in his teachings. The basic conception is, is that we do, and that we're, we believe as Baha'is that the best way to serve our countrymen, the best way to serve our nation, our region, our globe, is in the end to apply the social and spiritual teachings of Baha'u'llah, infused with the Spirit of God, to bring about a new way of ordering human affairs. And this is something that I often personally have to clarify to, to friends and family. You may think I'm wrong, right? You may think I am in error about the way that we will solve the problems that we are facing, the political, racial, and religious divisions. But do not question my intentions or my caring for the world. I am doing personally the, what I believe to be best for humanity. Therefore it falls to a discussion about the how and the what. Is it actually the way that we can actually haul, like heal the divisions and to solve the problems that we're actually facing as a society? That's really the question that has to come. It's not about intentions or willing to sacrifice or put forward time to help humanity. It's whether or not Baha'u'llah's claim is true. Whether or not his system of organizing the affairs of humanity is actually the panacea, the remedy for all things that it claims to be. But that in itself can actually only be discovered by an honest, open, genuine investigation of the truth of what actually his teachings are. Are not these intermittent crises that convulse present-day society due primarily to the lamentable inability of the world's recognized leaders to read or write the signs of the times? To rid themselves once for all of their preconceived ideas and fettering creeds and to reshape the machinery of their respective governments according to those standards that are implicit in Baha'u'llah's supreme declaration of the oneness of mankind, the chief and distinguishing feature of the faith he proclaimed. For the principle of the oneness of mankind, the cornerstone of Baha'u'llah's world-embracing dominion, implies nothing more nor less than the enforcement of his scheme for the unification of the world. 
quote continues. How pathetic, indeed, are the efforts of those leaders of human institutions who, in utter disregard of the spirit of the age, are striving to adjust national processes suited to the ancient days of self-contained nations, to an age which must either achieve the unity of the world as adumbrated by Baha'u'llah, or perish. At so critical an hour in the history of civilization, it behoves the leader, leaders of all the nations of the world, great and small, whether in the East or in the West, whether victors or vanquished, to give heed to the clarion call of Baha'u'llah, and thoroughly imbued with a sense of world solidarity, the sin qua non of loyalty to his cause, arise manfully to carry out in its entirety the one remedial scheme he, the divine physician, has prescribed for inhaling humanity. Let them discard once for all every preconceived idea, every national prejudice, and give heed to the sublime counsel of Abdu'l-Baha, the authorized expounder of his teachings. There's so much in this quote we could actually go through and discuss. I think in essence, for myself, it is that we are currently holding on to, as it says, preconceived ideas and fettering creeds that are holding us back from being able to bring humanity to a place of unity and solve the problems that we're actually facing. Whether or not that's true could only actually be found out by the independent investigation of truth. A real, genuine, honest investigation of the divine polity of Baha'u'llah, as it is the enforcement of his scheme for the unification of the world. And that really is what Baha'u'llah has actually brought to humanity, a scheme, a system, an order that can actually solve the problems that we're facing that addresses the individual and the collective issues of humanity and also addresses the racial, political, and religious divisions that are really eating at the vitals of society as a whole. And the Baha'i teachings themselves claim to actually be addressing the root cause of the ills that we're facing, the fundamental error that we are actually making which is actually seeing ourselves as inherently selfish, inherently purely physical beings, as individuals that are defined mostly and primarily by our political, racial, or religious affiliations. The world order adumbrated by Baha'u'llah is reared upon the oneness of humankind, that we are each part of a spiritual story that has covered the planet and that this is the day of the kingdom of God, where the divine gardener has come in to finally cultivate the globe itself. Uh, this section is the what. What is the most important work of the Baha'is themselves? He fully appreciates the fact that the believers locally in different parts of the world often feel that their political party is in many ways striving to accomplish the ideals akin to our Baha'i aims. But the fact remains that the only way for the Baha'is to preserve their international character, their unity and integrity, is for them individually to sacrifice these desired political affili affiliations for the universal good and the protection of the faith. In this letter on the behalf of the Guardian, he is empathizing and recognizing that many Baha'is throughout the world feel that their political party, or some political party within their government, has aims akin to the Baha'i goals, but that the only way, the only way for us to preserve the international character and the unity and integrity of the faith is to put those aside and actually work for the system that is to be the model for, a, for an embryonic world order. The next quote, the best way for a Baha'i to serve his country in the world is to work for the establishment of Baha'u'llah's world order which will gradually unite all men and do away with political systems, with divisive political systems and religious creeds. Once again, the Guardian is saying that the best way for you to serve your country is to establish Baha'u'llah's world order, which will do away with the divisive political systems and religious creeds that are dividing humanity. That the what, the most important work we're supposed to be doing, is actually teaching the faith, establishing patterns of social integration within our neighborhoods through the core activities and striving to build up the Baha'i administration itself. It is often through our misguided feeling that we can somehow aid our fellows better 
by some activity outside the faith, that Baha'is are led to indulge in politics. This is a dangerous delusion. As Shoghi Effendi's secretary wrote on his behalf, quote, what we Baha'is must face is the fact that society is rapidly disintegrating, so rapidly that moral issues, which were clear half a century ago, are now hopelessly confused, and what is more, thoroughly mixed up with battling political interests. That is why the Baha'is must turn all their forces into the channel of building up the Baha'i cause in its administration. They can neither change nor help the world in any other way at present. If they become involved in the issues the governments of the world are struggling over, they will be lost. But if they build up the Baha'i pattern, they can offer it as a remedy when all else has failed. We must build up our Baha'i system and leave the faulty systems of the world to go their own way. We cannot change them through becoming involved in them. On the contrary, they will destroy us. I think it's really important to acknowledge, uh, if you will, um, the strength of the language that is actually being used here. We have misguided feelings often that there's some other way that we can help humanity. And the Universal of Justice here is actually saying it is a dangerous delusion an extreme confusion, that we cannot change the world by doing that. We can't create a better world by doing that. It's that it will actually destroy us. We will become lost. We will become caught up in the tornado of the racial, ethnic, political, and religious differences that are actually behind the current maelstrom of problems that we see on the political surface. That, again, to look really at how this is being said, because it says, leave the faulty systems of the world to go their own way. What are we asked to do? Build up the world order. Offer a system that is not trying to force itself on the current political system, but is standing aside as a unified, harmonious conception reared on the foundations of the oneness of humankind and the religious unity of humankind, so that when these fail, they, the individuals outside the cause, can of their own accord, unpushed, unforced, turn and see a system that can solve the problems to allow them to do what they have to do. Because love for our fellow men and anguish at their plight are essential parts of a true Baha'i life. We are continually drawn to do what we can to help them. It is vitally important that we do so whenever the occasion presents itself, for our actions must say the same thing as our words. But this compassion for our fellows must not be allowed to divert our energies into channels which are ultimately doomed to failure, causing us to neglect the most important and fundamental work of all. There are hundreds of thousands of well-wishers of mankind who devote their lives to works of relief and charity, but a pitiful few to do the work which God himself most wants done, the spiritual awakening and regeneration of mankind. Our task? Building up the Baha'i system. Of course, Empathizing with our fellow men and striving to help them and, and expressing our compassion and love for humanity is, quote, essential part of a true Baha'i life. The question then becomes, how do you actually channel that passion? When you see suffering of humanity, how do you actually channel it in this world into, into channels of action and service? What are we told? We can't be allowed to have ourselves diverted into channels that are doomed to failure. That's a quote, right? We actually have to realize each time this pull happens that actually it is us here in the Baha'u'llah's world order that we can best serve humanity. And that there really there are a pitiful few who are truly trying to bring a new vision of political organization, of social organization, of relationships between the individual, the institutions, and society. That this is actually what the Baha'i faith is kind of really coming to bring to humanity. So when we feel those pulls, 
That is where we should put our energy. The solution given to the world's problems by Baha'u'llah is the only solution, being divine in origin, and most desperately needed. Therefore we, the few who have caught the vision, should not waste our energies beating up and down the paths pursued by humanity, and which are not solving its ghastly present-day problems. We should concentrate on the cause because it is what is needed to cure the world. This is a sound attitude, and if we don't devote ourselves to the Baha'i work and teaching, who will? Obviously non-Baha'is, people who don't believe in Baha'u'llah's message, are not going to put forward his teachings as the true divine remedy for humankind. And given the nature of our not being involved in political institutions or taking uh, donations from outside, the only ones that actually can do it are the Baha'is themselves. So if we don't devote ourselves to the building up of the administration and teaching Baha'u'llah's faith, uh, who will? And again, it's very clear here, the garden is saying it is the only solution. So if you have someone calling you to, you know, uh, for a plan to actually cure an ailment or a sickness or a pandemic, and they want you to start handing out, if you will, a remedy, right, a vaccine, but you know you actually have the true vaccine for this sickness, for this illness of humankind, to actually go around and start handing out a faulty vaccine or a faulty medicine or remedy is actually withholding the actual vaccine from the peoples of the world. Again, this may not be the position of the viewer or the reader of the writings of the central figure of the Baha'i Faith. Uh, once again, that can only be found out by actually an independent investigation of the truth of Baha'u'llah's claims, and really what is Baha'u'llah's world order? What is this divine polity that is being offered? This next quote is from the Guardian, and once again is very, very clear and very direct. We see that the political scene is becoming more involved and chaotic, and the chief actors are impotent to solve the world's problems. This is not the arena for the Baha'is. We must cast off from this sinking ship and devote ourselves exclusively to building up the world order of Baha'u'llah, which we know is the salvation for the entire planet. I don't know how the Guardian could actually be more clear. Um, and at the same time, it's quotes like this or statements like this that often can very, very quickly be misinterpreted by people. He's saying, we must cast off from this sinking ship. That can easily be interpreted as, oh, you're just abandoning us. You're just leaving us to drown. Uh, a sentiment that sees in a quote like this as if we don't care. But this has to be seen in the context of the entirety of the Baha'i writings and everything we've been looking at. And turning to the person and saying, no, we actually really, really, really do care. We have a remedy or a vaccine or a medicine we think actually can solve the problems you're trying to solve. And we believe if we start delivering this medicine, it's not going to cure it. That's why we have to be here. Even to look at the ship analogy itself, there's a sinking ship. And it's not that we're simply abandoning them in some little tiny dinghy, or you know what I mean, or a lifesaver. We're actually inviting them to get on an ark, a ship that is there to save all the people on the sinking ship, and it is right over there. That is actually what the Baha'is are trying to do, trying to offer a new vehicle for humankind, a greater vehicle, an ark that can sail upon the turbulent seas that we're currently in, and are on the horizon. The next section, the how. The driving force behind activism and the focus of our studies. Baha'is in every land are ready, nay anxious, to associate with any association of men which, after careful scrutiny, they feel satisfied is free from every tinge of partisanship and politics, and is wholly devoted to the interests of all mankind. It continues, we would extend any moral and material assistance they can afford after having fulfilled their share of support to those institutions that affect directly the interests of the cause. 
They should always bear in mind, however, the dominating purpose of such a collaboration, which is to secure in time the recognition by those with whom they are associated of the paramount necessity and the true significance of the Baha'i revelation in this day. So in this quote the Guardian is actually saying that we actually have to, before associating ourselves with any movement, ensure that it is, quote, free from every tinge of partisanship and politics. Secondly, the second step is to ensure that we have fulfilled our share of support for the institutions of the faith, and that even then once we begin to associate ourselves with some movement, some association, that we have to bear in mind what is the chief goal. It's seeing ourselves as, okay, well we agree on this principle, we agree on this attention, intention, but at the same time we actually have to give them a deeper understanding of the true significance of Baha'u'llah's revelation. Once again, they themselves might have a small ship beside the sinking ship, and we're trying to show that we actually have an ark that can actually save all the people. So we actually see that their motivations are beautiful, that they are akin to ours, but we still have to have the paramount necessity of showing them the true remedy for the world's ills. Again, the Guardian. If the Baha'is want to be really effective in teaching the cause, they need to discuss intelligently, intellectually, the present condition of the world and its problems. We need Baha'i scholars, not only people far, far more deeply aware of what our teachings really are, but also well-read and well-educated people capable of correlating our teachings to the current thoughts of the leaders of society. We Baha'i should arm our minds with knowledge in order to better demonstrate to especially the educated classes, the truths enshrined in our faith. What the Guardian, however, does not advise the friends to do is to dissipate their time and energies in serving movements that are akin to our principles, but not, we believe, capable of solving the present-day spiritual crisis the world finds itself in. We can cooperate with such movements and their promoters to good effect, while at the same time openly standing forth as Baha'is, with a specific program to offer society. So first of all, the Guardian is saying that we actually really, really need people who are beginning to study the world order, deeply studying the Baha'i Faith, in order to intellectually, intelligently discuss this with the educated classes. So they can see that within the Baha'i teachings and within the Baha'i world order, a central feature of Baha'u'llah's teachings, that this is actually how we can solve the problems that we're facing. That we, the Guardian, quote, does not advise the friends to dissipate their time and energies in serving movements that are akin to Baha'i principles, and that when we're associating with individuals within those movements, that we are to openly stand forth as Baha'is with a specific program for the solving of the world's problems. They might have a ship, they might have good intentions, so we actually, in pointing out the arc, if you will, that is here to save him and kind, be educated enough, be under wise enough and intelligent enough to be able to communicate it to these people so they can see that no, that actually really is a very large ship here to save everyone. We will in the future be looking, in subsequent videos, at really what the teachings are of this divine ark that Baha'is believe has come to actually solve the world's problems and save the people from the sinking ship. Currently, we're just looking at the non-interference or non-involvement in politics because we want to see why it is that Baha'is seem to stand aloof from the problems of society, but at the exact same time are actually really, really engaged in doing their best to actually solve the problems, simply in the way they truly and genuinely believe can solve these issues. It seems that what we need now is a more profound and coordinated Baha'i scholarship in order to attract such men as you are contacting. The world has, at least the thinking world, caught up by now with all the great and universal principles enunciated by Baha'u'llah over 70 years ago, and so of course it does not sound new to them. But we know that the deeper teachings, the capacity of his projected world order to recreate society, are new and dynamic. It is these we must learn to present intelligently and enticingly to such men. Once again, the Guardian is asking for more profound by scholarship. That there are many principles that, when they were enunciated by Baha'u'llah, 
in the 19th century and promulgated by Abdu'l-Baha in his travels to the West were actually quite controversial, quite new. The relationship between religion and science, the equality of men and women, the equality of the races, there are numerous, numerous principles in the Baha'i faith that were, would have been absolutely shocking when they were actually put forward. Some of those teachings people have actually caught up to after all these years. But it is to such individuals that still the deeper teachings and the quote, the capacity of his projected world order to recreate society, those are new and dynamic. This is why the Baha'i scholarship needs to be deeply focused in understanding the world order of Baha'u'llah, its administration and its political structure, which is the vehicle that is going to carry into effect all of the teachings of Baha'u'llah. That's what we really need because we have to be able to communicate it intellectually and enticingly to such individuals. When we consider truly presenting the teachings of Baha'u'llah to the wider community of our planet, we have to consider that there are aspects that could be easily misunderstood regarding what the Baha'is see in the future as being the outcome of Baha'u'llah's teachings. One of this has the potential to actually create what is sort of a wolf in sheep's clothing problem that I've alluded to before. You see, the Baha'i faith itself is non is not a partisan political system. Uh, to highlight that, I just want to read a text actually from the Universals of Justice. As one studies these words, one begins to understand the processes at work in the gradual unfoldment and establishment of the Baha'i system. Clearly the establishment of the Kingdom of God on Earth is a political enterprise, and the teachings of the faith are filled with political principles using the word in the sense of the science of government and of the organization of human society. At the same time, the Baha'i world community repeatedly and emphatically denies being a political organization, and Baha'is are required, on pain of the deprivation of their administrative rights, to refrain becoming, from becoming involved in political matters and from taking sides in political disputes. In other words, the Baha'is are following a completely different path from that usually followed by those who wish to reform society. They eschew political methods towards the achievement of their aims, and concentrate on revitalizing the hearts, minds, and behavior of people, and on presenting a working model as evidence of the reality and practicality of the way of life they propound. As was suggested at the beginning of this deepening, uh, to suggest or state to someone that the Baha'i Faith is a non-political system, it's not involved in politics at all, could easily uh, create a misunderstanding, because as we shall see when we begin to look at the Baha'i writings, the future world order of Baha'u'llah, as it shall interact um, with the global society, is de definitively political. As I mentioned before, it has economic theory, electoral theory, it has uh, conceptions of politics that relate to local, regional, national, and international political organization. And here the Universal Source of Justice is noting that clearly the establishment of the Kingdom of God, which actually Baha'is believe the world order of Baha'u'llah to be, is a political enterprise, <laughs> and that uh, the Baha'i teachings themselves are rife with political concepts. At the same time, we're um, told emphatically within the Baha'i writings that we are not to become involved in the political disputes or the partisan political machinations, if you will, of current politics. And this quote ended stating that we are following a completely different path. And it is to understand what that path is that is so vital for this day within Baha'i scholarship and just deepening in general. Because we want to be able to state, yes, in some sense, the, the Baha'i conception of society is itself political in the definition of the organization of society or the science of government, but it is not political in the sense that we are not trying to actually sway people within the political arena to our side to implement our policies. Um, this will become clearer as we move on. The final sentence in this quote from the Universals of Justice highlights what is the model of Baha'i interaction. Uh, I quote, 
presenting a working model as evidence of the reality and practicality of the way of life they propound. This is why in the former quotes we keep seeing this working, uh, standing, uh, like standing fully as Baha'is, to actually working for the Baha'i system itself. Because we're trying to create a working model on the side that can be looked at by people, but at the same time not trying to put pressure on governments to actually implement policies we wish. There is a very simple misunderstanding that can actually occur. When the way we represent the faith, even with pure intentions, clashes with what someone might see within the writings of the Baha'i Faith. This can generate a problem called a wolf in sheep's clothing. Because oftentimes I've been present and Baha'is are saying that the Baha'i Faith is in no way political. And that's true in one definition of political. At the same time, when you're saying that the Baha'i Faith is not political, but you actually believe it as an electoral system, and as we shall see, the Baha'i Faith proposes that it will one day actually be the governing structure of the entire planet, this can have someone suddenly jump up and say, well you're saying the Baha'i Faith is not political, but at the same time I see an entire political order being built by the Baha'is, and you believe as a Baha'i, I believe we shall see, that actually the Baha'i Faith will cover the globe and be the very fabric of society. Uh, this generates misunderstandings because if we are saying on the one hand that it is non-political, but it is actually seeking to establish a political order across the globe, uh, this can raise suspicions. This is why we have to be so clear and, and emphatically open, if you will, about what the Baha'i Faith believes, so that we can then explain through the non-involvement of politics how this will come about and will not come about, to alleviate the concerns and worries of individuals, groups, and governments all over. As we will see in the Baha'i Writings, the, as Baha'u'llah says, the sovereign remedy for humankind is the union of all peoples under one common faith. This quote here is from the Universal House of Justice. Inseparable from the Baha'i perspective on politics is a particular conception of history, its course and direction. Humanity, it is the firm conviction of every follower of Baha'u'llah, is approaching today the crowning stage in a millennia-long process, which has brought it from its collective infancy to the threshold of maturity, a stage that will witness the unification of the human race. So this next quote is from Abdu'l-Baha. Ultimately, war will be entirely banned. And when the laws of the Most Holy Book are enacted, arguments and disputes will with perfect justice be settled before a universal tribunal of governments and peoples. And any difficulties which may arise will be resolved. The five continents of the world will become as one, its diverse nations will become one nation, the earth will become one homeland, and the human race will become one people. Countries will be so intimately connected, and peoples and nations so commingled and united, that the human race will become as one family and one kindred. The light of heavenly love will shine, and the gloomy darkness of hatred and enmity will be dispelled as far as possible. Universal peace will raise its pavilion in the midmost heart of creation, and the blessed tree of life will so grow and flourish as to stretch its sheltering shade over the east and the west, strong and weak, rich and poor, contending kindreds and hostile nations, which are like the wolf and the lamb, the leopard and kid, the lion and the calf, will treat one another with the utmost love, unity, justice, and equity. The earth will be filled with the knowledge and learning, with the realities and mysteries of creation, with the knowledge of God. It continues, one of the great events which is to occur in the day of the manifestation of that incomparable branch is hoisting of the standard of God among all nations. Why this is meant that all nations and kindreds will be gathered together under the shadow of this divine banner, which is no other than the lordly branch itself, and will become a single nation. Religious and sectarian antagonism, the hostility of races and peoples, and the difference among nations will be eliminated. All men will adhere to one religion will have one common faith, will be blended into one race and become a single people. All will dwell in one common fatherland, 
which is the planet itself. Universal peace and concord will be established among all nations. This is a radiant vision of the future of humanity. And it's important to understand that this really is what the Baha'i Faith proclaims is the future of humanity. And what Baha'is are called upon to work towards, which is the establishment of the Kingdom of God on Earth. That Kingdom prophesied within Scriptures. It is that, if you will, where all the peoples of the world will go up to the mountain of God to learn of His ways. That we will have one common faith. This faith, the Baha'i Faith, is a fully globally oriented religion. I would like to read some more passages, the first from Baha'u'llah. All matters of state should be referred to the house of justice, but acts of worship must be observed according to that which God hath revealed in his book. Here in the most holy book of Baha'u'llah's revelation, he states that all matters of state are to be referred to the house of justice. In quoting Shoghi Effendi, he says, Dearly beloved friends, this new world order whose promise is enshrined in the revelation of Baha'u'llah, whose fundamental principles have been enunciated in the writings of the center of his covenant, involves no less than the complete unification of the entire human race. This unification should conform to such principles as would directly harmonize with the spirit that animates and the laws that govern the operation of the institutions that already constitute the structural basis of the administrative order of his faith. No machinery falling short of the standard inculcated by the Baha'i Revelation, and at variance with the sublime pattern ordained in his teachings, which the collective efforts of mankind may yet devise, can ever hope to achieve anything above or beyond that lesser piece, to which the author of our faith has himself alluded to in his writings. Now that you have refused the most great peace, he, admonishing the kings and rulers of the earth, has written, hold ye fast unto this lesser peace, that happily ye may, in some degree, better your own conditions and that of your dependents. Shoghi Effendi continues, The most great peace, on the other hand, is conceived by Baha'u'llah, a peace that must inevitably follow as the practical consequence of the spiritualization of the world, and the fusion of all its races, creeds, classes, and nations, can rest on no other basis, and can be preserved through no other agency except the divinely appointed ordinances that are implicit in the world order that stands associated with his holy name. In his tablet, revealed almost seventy years ago to Queen Victoria, Baha'u'llah, alluding to, his most, to this most great peace, has declared, That which the Lord hath ordained as the sovereign remedy and the mightiest instrument for the healing of all the world is the union of all its peoples in one universal cause, one common faith. This can in no wise be achieved except through the power of a skilled and all-powerful and inspired physician. So here in the world order of Baha'u'llah, penned by Shoghi Effendi the Guardian, we're told that no machinery that falls short of the order, the most great peace, put forward in the writings of Baha'u'llah, can in the end actually achieve the unity, the true unity of humankind. It even states that no machinery that falls short of his teachings even which the collective efforts of mankind may yet devise, can ever achieve anything more than what is called in the Baha'i writings the lesser peace. The lesser peace being a political union. He then moves on, the most great peace, which is the goal, the true goal of the Baha'i revelation, can rest on no other basis and be preserved through no other agency, he says except the ordinances implicit in Baha'u'llah's writings themselves. It is the mightiest instrument for the healing of the world as a union of all humankind in one universal cause, one common faith. To be actually come under, if you will, the boughs of the tree of the revelation of Baha'u'llah. That's what Baha'is are seeking to achieve. This is what Baha'u'llah has actually proclaimed to humankind. This is what he proclaimed, as is alluded to in the passage, in his tablets to the sovereigns, the kings and queens and emperors and sultans of the planet. This quote is from Shoghi Effendi, again from the world order of Baha'u'llah. 
Not only will the present day spiritual assemblies be styled differently in the future, but they will be enabled also to add to their present functions those powers, duties, and prerogatives necessitated by the recognition of the faith of Baha'u'llah, not merely as one of the recognized religious systems of the world, but as the state religion of an independent and sovereign power. And as the Baha'i faith permeates the masses of the peoples of East and West, and its truth is embraced by the majority of the peoples of a number of the sovereign states of the world, will the Universal House of Justice again attain the plenitude of its power, and exercise, as the supreme organ of the Baha'i Commonwealth, all the rights, the duties, and responsibilities incumbent upon the world's future superstate. Will the Baha'i faith in the future, according to the Guardian and the World Order of Baha'u'llah, become the state religion of an independent and sovereign power? Yes, that's what we just read. And will, in the future, as Baha'i states begin to be more numerous than one, will the Universal House of Justice itself be the supreme organ of a Baha'i Commonwealth? That is, it seems to be clearly what the Baha'i writings are teaching here in the words of Shoghi Effendi in the World Order of Baha'u'llah. Regarding the question raised in your letter, Shoghi Effendi believes that for the present, the movement, whether in the East or the West, should be dissociated entirely from politics. This was the explicit injunction of Abdu'l Baha. Eventually, however, as you have rightly conceived it, the movement will, as soon as it is fully developed and recognized, embrace both religious and political issues. In fact, Baha'u'llah clearly states that affairs of state, as well as religious questions, are to be referred to the House of Justice, into which the assemblies of the Baha'is will eventually evolve. The Universal House of Justice then continues. The administrative order is certainly the nucleus and pattern of the world order of Baha'u'llah, but it is in embryonic form, and must undergo major evolutionary developments in the course of time. Certain passages in the writings on this subject establish matters of principle, certain ones describe the ultimate goal of the Most Great Peace, and certain of them relate to stages of development on the way to the attainment of that goal. For example, in this familiar passage in his Will and Testament, Abdu'l-Bahá states, This house of justice enacteth the laws and the government enforceth them. The legislative body must reinforce the executive. The executive must aid and assist the legislative body, so that through the close union and harmony of these two forces, the foundation of fairness and justice may become firm and strong, that all the regions of the world may become even as paradise itself. In a response to a question about the government, in the above passage, Shoghi Effendi's secretary wrote on his behalf, on the 18th of April 1941, the following clarification. By government is meant the executive body which will enforce the laws when the Baha'i faith has reached a point when it is recognized and accepted entirely by any particular nation. So what do we find here within this passage? That it will be recognized in, by a state and embrace both religious and political issues. That to understand many of the passages within the Baha'i writings, we have to understand that some of the passages within the Baha'i writings are referring to the ultimate goal, the Most Great Peace. Some are giving general principles, and some are, if you will, shedding light upon the process where we will go from where we are to the Most Great Peace itself. Here the government, as written in the Will and Testament of Abdu'l-Bahá, is itself the executive body will, that will enforce the laws when the Baha'i faith has become recognized and accepted by an entire nation, as we have seen before, the state religion. At this point, this brings us to what is often a very uncomfortable term, and I think for understandable reasons, as we shall see in the past. It is the term theocracy. And rather than <laughs> preempting this, we'll just read several passages from the Baha'i writings. This first is from a letter of the Universal House of Justice in 1995 on the 27th of April. Dear Baha'i friend, your email of 19 February 1995 addressed to the research department was referred to the Universal House of Justice. In it you quote two phrases which appear in a book you have recently read and which seem from the context to be citations from Shoghi Effendi. These phrases are Baha'i theocracy and humanity will emerge from the immature civilization in which church and state are separate. You ask whether these references can be authenticated and dated, 
we have instructed to send you the following reply. A reverence to Baha'i theocracy is to be found in a letter written on behalf of the Guardian to an individual Baha'i on the 30th of September 1949. This reads as follows. He thinks your question is well put. What the Guardian was referring to was the theocratic systems such as the Catholic Church and the Caliphate, which are not divinely given as systems, but man-made, and yet, being partly derived from the teachings of Christ and Muhammad, are in a sense theocracies. The Baha'i theocracy, on the contrary, is both divinely ordained as a system, and, of course, based on the teachings of the Prophet himself. So was the phrase Baha'i theocracy actually used by the Guardian? Yes, it was. It is being supported here by the Universal House of Justice itself, with the help of the Research Department at the World Center. It is stated that the theocratic systems of the past are not true theocratic systems. Why? Because in the case used of the Catholic Church or the Caliphate of Islam, they are not themselves actually div fully divinely given systems, even though they are somewhat derived from the writings of the Prophet Founders, Christ and the Prophet Muhammad. Whereas the Baha'i Theocracy, the Guardian states, is both divinely ordained and based on the actual writings of Baha'u'llah. The next quote. This is again from the same letter. The gradual process of the evolution of the Baha'i administrative order into the world order of Baha'u'llah has been described by Shulgi Effendi in many of his writings, as in the following excerpt from his letter of the 30th of April 1953 to the All-America Intercontinental Teaching Conference. This present crusade on the threshold of which we now stand will, moreover, by virtue of the dynamic forces it will release, and its wide repercussions over the entire surface of the globe, contribute effectually to the acceleration of yet another process of tremendous significance, which will carry the steadily evolving faith of Baha'u'llah through its present stages of obscurity, of repression, of emancipation, and of recognition, stages one or another of which the Baha'i national community in various parts of the world will now find themselves, into the stage of establishment, the stage at which the faith of Baha'u'llah will be recognized by the civil authorities as a state religion, similar to that which Christianity entered in the years following the death of the Emperor Constantine, a stage which must later be followed by the emergence of the Baha'i state itself, functioning in all religious and civil matters in strict accordance with the laws and ordinances of the kitab i -Akdas, the Most Holy, the Mother Book of the Baha'i Revelation, a stage which, in the fullness of time, will culminate in the establishment of the World Baha'i Commonwealth, functioning in the plenitude of its powers, and which will signalize the long-awaited advent of the Christ-promised Kingdom of God on Earth, the Kingdom of Baha'u'llah, mirroring, however faintly, upon this humble handful of dust, the glories of the Abha Kingdom. It's important to note here that this is actually a quote of the Guardian in 1953, being shared within a letter by the Universals of Justice. And it is a quite striking quote, because we see that the Baha'i Faith will actually move through stages, one of obscurity, one of a repression, of emancipation and recognition, but finally to, to establishment. And what is this stage of establishment? It is when the Baha'i Faith was recognized by the civil authorities as the state religion. So the Guardian gives the example of the state of Christianity after the death of Constantine, when it became the state religion of the Roman Empire itself. But then there's a later stage, which is the emergence of the Baha'i state itself. So not just recognized as the state religion, but it actually becomes a Baha'i state, according to Shoghi Effendi. And that the laws and ordinances of the Most Holy Book then culminate, when other states follow suit, in a Baha'i world commonwealth. And this is stated by the Guardian here to be what? The long-awaited advent of the Christ-promised Kingdom of God on Earth, where we will go to the mountain of the Lord to learn His ways. All the nations will come and the government it will be upon his shoulders. He of the Messiah in the second coming of Christ. Another quote 
from the Universal Halls of Justice. Whereas former faiths inspired hearts and illumined souls, they eventuated in formal religions with an ecclesiastical organization, creeds, rituals, and churches, while the faith of Baha'u'llah, likewise, renewing man's spiritual life, will gradually produce the institutions of an ordered society, fulfilling not merely the function of churches of the past, but also the function of the civil state, by this manifestation of the divine will in a higher degree than in former ages, humanity will emerge from that immature civilization in which church and state are separate and competitive institutions, and partake of a true civilization in which spiritual and social principles are at last reconciled as two aspects of one and the same truth. So we see here again that the Baha'i faith will in its time gradually produce the institutions of an ordered society, again, fulfilling not merely the function of the churches of the past, but also the functions of the civil state. That this is actually, if we are to speak to our fellow men, our fellow brothers and sisters in this world, this is actually what the Baha'i faith, again in my understanding, teaches to humanity. It is a system that has no interest in the political machinery and machinations of politicians. It wishes to stay aloof from such things, work within the domain, as we shall see, of grassroots development, the consolidation of its own institutions, its own political structure, to offer it as a model for those who would be interested in adopting it of their own free will in what we would call an intentional community. For the Baha'i laws themselves, do not pertain to those who have not accepted them as their own. We chose to place this study of the governmental, uh, state religion, <laughs> even a theocratic system, right alongside with non-involvement in politics, because we have to be able to understand what is here being said in light of the complete prohibition against meddling in the political affairs of governments. There's no better place to actually study it, really. Um, so we're going to look at several passages, again, from the Universal House of Justice and from The Guardian. This here is from Shoghi Effendi in the World Order of Baha'u'llah. As the number of Baha'i communities in various parts of the world multiplies, and their power as a social force becomes increasingly apparent, they will no doubt find themselves increasingly subjected to the pressure which men of authority and influence in the political domain will exercise in the hope of attaining the support they require for the advancement of their aims. These communities will, moreover, feel a growing need of the goodwill and assistance of their respective governments in their efforts to widen the scope and to consolidate the foundations of the institutions committed to their charge. Let them beware, lest, in their eagerness to further the aims of their beloved cause, they should be led unwittingly to bargain with their faith to compromise with their essential principles, or to sacrifice in return for any material advantage which their institutions may derive, the integrity of their spiritual ideals. Let them proclaim that in whatever country they reside, however advanced their institutions, or profound their desire to enforce the laws and apply the principles enunciated by Baha'u'llah, they will unhesitatingly subordinate the operation of such laws and the application of such principles to the requirements and legal enactments of their respective governments. Theirs is not the purpose to violate under any circumstances the provisions of their country's constitution, much less to allow the machinery of their administration to supersede the government of their respective countries. In this passage, the Guardian is warning the Baha'is on the one hand, that as they progress, as the Baha'i faith advances, that they have to be very, very, very careful that no matter how much they wish to widen the scope, no matter how much they wish to put forward the teachings of Baha'u'llah, that they cannot in any way bargain with the faith. To bargain with the essential principles, because we have to keep the faith itself and its integrity, its ideals, fully intact. And that in order to do this, we must proclaim as Baha'is in whatever country we are in, that we will actually subordinate all of the administrative uh, aspects of the Baha'i faith 
to the laws and ordinances of the existing government, and that in no way, shape, or form could the Baha'is violate, again, quote, under any circumstances, the provisions of their country's constitution, much allow the Baha'i faith to actually supersede that government. I remember the first time I actually read this, I chuckled, because um, this is being said by the Guardian in the early 20th century when the Baha'i faith is very small. And it's talking about a future time when the Baha'is will become so numerous, and the Baha'i administrative order itself so manifest and obvious, that at times the, the government will try to barter or bargain with the Baha'i community, offering, if you will, uh, giving offerings to further the aims of the Baha'i cause, if we will actually bargain with the integrity of our ideals. And then at the same time will become so, if you will, prominent within the society that we could violate or seem to threaten the constitution of a resident government. But that under no circumstances are we ever allowed to do this. So what has often come up is how is this possible if the Baha'i Faith itself cannot in any way override the constitution of a country, how can we ever have a Baha'i state that we have seen that we will? How will we ever take over the civil aspects, not only the church, or if you will, religious aspects of life? Um, we're going to continue reading for a second. In striving to attain a clear and fuller understanding of the world order of Baha'u'llah, we need to contemplate the operation of the Baha'i principles of governance and social responsibility as they persist through changing sets of conditions. From the present time when the Baha'i community constitutes a small number of people living in a variety of overwhelming non-Baha'i societies, to the far different situation in future centuries, when the Baha'is are becoming, and eventually have become, the vast majority of the people. Again from the Universals of Justice. As for the statement made by Shoghi Effendi in his letter, on the 21st of March, 1932, the well-established principles of the faith concerning the relationship of the Baha'i institutions to those of the country in which the Baha'is reside make it unthinkable, unthinkable, that they would ever purpose to violate a country's constitution, or so to meddle in its political machinery, as to attempt to take over the powers of government. This is an integral element of the Baha'i principle of abstention from involvement in politics. However, this does not by any means imply that the country itself may not, by constitutional means, decide to adopt Baha'i laws and practices, and modify its constitution or method of government accordingly. So again, Baha'is, if we are true to the teachings of our faith, see it as unthinkable that we would violate a, con a country's constitution, or ever meddle within the political machinery to attempt to take power. This is fundamentally against all of the writings of the Baha'i Faith regarding the way we interact with the society at large. It is unthinkable, if we're being true to this faith, that we would never ever try to take over government or meddle within their politics. But then the, the Universal of Justice says, however, this does not mean, by any means imply that the country itself may not, by constitutional means, to decide to adopt Baha'i laws and practices. This is a very peculiar concept, <laughs> because we're, it seems as if they're saying the country itself may choose to change their constitution to adopt Baha'i principles and Baha'i governance. In order to understand this, we'll continue with some readings. The Baha'is will be called upon to assume the reins of government when they will come to constitute the majority of the population in a given country. And even then, their participation in political affairs is bound to be limited in scope unless they attain a similar majority in some other countries as well. The Baha'is must remain nonpartisan in all political affairs. In the distant future, however, when the majority of a country have become Baha'is, then it will lead to the establishment of a Baha'i state. So we see on the one hand that we cannot meddle in the political machinery of the, of the countries that we live in. We see as well that we cannot force our policies upon any government, 
We cannot override a constitution, but there will come a time when the Baha'is reach such a num numerical percentage of the population that we will assume the reins of government. The Universal House of Justice tells us that of course we ourselves cannot undermine it or seize reins of government, therefore it has to be changed by the government itself in accordance with its own, if you will, political machinery to hand over reins of the government. And I'm sure to many people this sounds rather strange, <laughs> that a non-Baha'i governing body would choose of its own accord to actually hand the reins of power over to the Baha'i faith, thus instituting, if you will, a, a Baha'i state. And I think if we really look at the concepts underlying the principles of democratic institutions, in my own opinion, we can at least see a way as to how this could possibly happen. If we take a nation, say to make it very, very simple, where we actually have a hundred million people in that nation. And of the hundred million people, let's say 98 million or 95 million of them are Baha'is. And again, this is just simply a thought experiment. At least at some point, given that the Baha'is themselves will be dealing with the national houses of justice, the national ruling, elected ruling bodies of the Baha'i faith, the local houses of justice themselves, or the local spiritual assemblies, and the universal house of justice, and regional councils, that the Baha'is will be fully working within neighborhoods, trying to build civil society, and really are being governed by the houses of justice of the Baha'i system. At the same time, they're willing to subordinate any of those facets of the administrative machinery to the ruling government, which would in this case be the civil authorities. So if, as we have seen in actual history, if those civil authorities came and told the Baha'is to shut the entire system down, as we've seen in previous quotes, the Baha'is will. And if this continues on, there comes a point where the population of Baha'is is so large, there comes, again I propose, uh, what would be a legitimacy problem. Where you have the elected officials of five million ruling the vast, vast majority of a state. And in some sense, they, the Baha'is, will listen to anything you say, right? And of course, this civil authority themselves, recognizing that they, a, a striking minority, is ruling over a striking majority, will begin to try to, of course, make allowances for this group. That group, the Baha'is themselves, want nothing to do with imposing their political aims upon the secular authorities. I would suggest that there must come a time when the secular, secular authorities themselves really honestly just come out and say, just give it to them. We are a wholly illegitimate political institution that is wielding power over 95% of the population, and we have no problem with these people. We have no problem with them at all. They have never meddled in our political affairs. They actually don't campaign against us. They listen to everything we do. They're good citizens. And in the end, in some sense, even though the secular authorities are ruling, we, the secular authorities, are their citizens. It's that you end up having an extreme minority within a state ruling over top of an extreme majority of a state. So in what way could this extreme minority be said to actually be reflective of the democratic will of the people of the nation? You get to really what is a legitimacy problem. Is this non-Baha'i authority ruling over, say, 95% of the population, truly a representation of the will of the people? Obviously not in its totality. <laughs> the following series of excerpts are actually from a letter by the Universal House of Justice um, on the 23rd of December 2008 on speaking on sociopolitical issues. So it begins here, our first quote. This principle, which demands strict avoidance of any type of partisan political activity, must be scrupulously upheld. However, as society and its political processes evolve, and as the faith grows, the interaction between the two becomes increasingly complex. 
The House of Justice will provide the necessary guidance over time to apply this principle to existing circumstances. So we've seen this principle before in, in quotes, that we are to eschew as much as we can any partisan political activity, but the society as it grows and as the Baha'i faith grows, it becomes increasingly more complex to handle this. And we are to defer to the administration for guidance on how that will actually be applied. The next quote from the same letter. The term politics can have a broad meaning, and therefore it is important to distinguish between partisan political activity and the discourse and action intended to bring about constructive social change. While the former is prescribed, the latter is enjoined. Indeed, a central purpose of the Baha'i community is social transformation. This is a theme that has often come up in my own discussion with friends and family over the years. Because in one sense I will say I, am, I don't believe in uh, partisan politics. And from one perspective, I might seem apolitical, as in not political at all. But at the same time, we are enjoined to bring about constructive social change. And in that, it's a central purpose of the Baha'i community of social transformation, as we see now so much the Baha'i faith is reaching out into communities, trying to develop civil society, to create, if you will, a web to catch a falling civilization. So we're very much engaged. We actually have the Baha'i international community, which has a seat, a non-governmental seat in the United Nations, communicating about ways of actually fostering harmonious growth within communities globally. This is a massive push and investigation of the Baha'i faith. Is that political? Well, in one sense of the term political, it's very political. It's about trying to create social change. Uh, one form of political activity, that of actually being involved in partisan politics, is prohibited. But that form of political activity, which is bringing about social change and building civil society, is a fundamental purpose of the Baha'i Faith itself. Another quote from the same letter. The organized endeavors of the Baha'i community in these areas are reinforced by the diverse initiatives of believers, working in various fields, as volunteers, professionals, and experts, to contribute to social change. The distinctive nature of their approach is to avoid conflict and the contest for power, while striving to unite people in the search for underlying moral and spiritual principles, and for practical measures that can lead to the just resolution of the problems afflicting society. Baha'is perceive humanity as a single body. All are inseparably bound to one another. A social order structured to meet the needs of one group at the expense of another results in injustice and oppression. Instead, the best interest of each component part is achieved by considering its needs in the context of the well-being of the whole. So is the Baha'i community itself does it have organized endeavors for creating social change? Yes, it does. In that context, it is political. And that its distinctive nature is that we are attempting to avoid conflict and the contest for power that is often inseparable from the political institutions of our day. And while we strive to help people search for underlying moral principles to apply to the healing of humanity's ills. As we saw at the beginning of this, that for Baha'is to divide themselves one against another, based upon party lines, would be to be diametrically opposed to the fundamental principle and spirit of the Baha'i Faith, which is to bring unity to humankind. Another quote from the same letter. You are no doubt aware of the general advice written on behalf of the Guardian that one way to criticize the social and political order of the day without siding with or opposing an existing regime is to offer a deeper analysis on the level of political theory, rather than practical politics. So is there in the process of being a political creature, defined as someone who is working for social change, a way we can act at the grassroots level? Again, in my understanding, yes, by trying to create civil society and build up communities with the core activities of the plans of the house, reaching out to our friends and neighbors. At the same time, there is this deeper analysis on the level of political theory that we can seek to understand how politics can be organized 
And given that we as Baha'is, as we have seen, are to present the administrative order of the Baha'i faith as a model to be studied, we can actually look at the political theory underlying the Baha'i world order and show how it relates to the problems and challenges of the world. But this needs deeper and deeper study by individuals and groups and communities into the fundamental tenets of Baha'i political theory. Challenges will inevitably arise. For example, you may find that an issue pertaining to social action has been co-opted by the political debate among competing factions, and wisdom will be required to determine whether you adjust your approach or let the matter rest for a time. In some cases it may be necessary to forego opportunities that would thrust you into political debate or criticism of partisan policies of governments. In other instances, there may be special sensitivities, such as topics related to countries where the Baha'i community faces hardship or oppression, when comments could create the impression that the friends are engaged in political activity against the interests of a particular government. These same considerations arise when evaluating invitations from the media to comment or engage in discussion on the political affairs of the day. Your National Spiritual Assembly is available to assist you in clarifying particular questions should the need arise. So we can see, we see in this letter actually that you can have issues which are maybe initially considered as an issue of social change, some social policy, some social issue, which then can actually suddenly be co-opted by a political party and become, if you will, a wedge issue between two political parties. Where, as I understand it, as we begin to comment on this, because this letter is written actually to us, uh, a political scientist, a Baha'i who is also a political scientist, when we begin to comment on this, we suddenly are seen as the outside world as weighing in on a partisan political issue, something that is dividing the country. And it says, it seems like it's saying, in some cases, it may be necessary to forego any opportunities, any dialogues that would thrust you into what is seen as a divisive political debate. So you might have to adjust your approach, or you might actually have to just let the matter rest for a time. There are other, if you will, avenues of serving humanity rather than engaging in something that is becoming politically acrimonious. We also see, integral to this final quote from this letter, once again, the fact that when you're evaluating invitations from media to comment, or you're trying to deal with a certain political issue, but you don't know if it's been co-opted by partisan uh, activities, the National Spiritual Assembly is always there to consult with. That some of these issues, as we saw previously from another letter of the House, become so complex that guidance from the institutions is needed, who actually have offices of external affairs all throughout the globe, that to turn to them to seek clarification on these issues, in spite of actually the non-partisan nature of the Baha'i faith, in spite of all the quotes <laughs> um, of how Baha'is cannot and are entirely prohibited by trying, from trying to force our beliefs and our policies on an existing government, that we are, it is unthinkable, if you will, that the Baha'i faith would ever seek to undermine a country's constitution or meddle in their political machinery, all these being allusions and quotes from the Baha'i writings. Many might still have misgivings. The Baha'i faith here, it sounds like, is actually promoting a concept of a future, one state religion, super state religion, and in a sense, although completely uh, democratically elected, a theocratic system in the future. One, obviously, how does this possibly work, especially if there are non-Baha'is in the world? How do we guard against despotism? What is the treatment of minorities? And honestly, I can understand this because when we look in the past, we see these systems that we take as theocracies, although we know they were not actually founded upon the actual express writings of the central figures of, say, Christianity and Islam, how do we see this playing out? For someone to have misgivings is very understandable. Um, this is something that I believe we actually have to put aside for a, an actual deepening in itself, uh, to really investigate this. Just as we're going to have to take specific uh, sections purely to look at the electoral systems of the Baha'i faith, 
of how the Baha'i Faith actually brings in all the beneficial aspects of different forms of government, but not their problems. Those are for future studies. I do wish, however, for those who have misgivings, to actually share a quote from the Universal House of Justice on this very topic. In answer to those who raise objections to this vision of a worldwide commonwealth, inspired by a divine revelation, fearing for the freedom of minority groups or of the individual under such a system, we can explain the Baha'i principle of, holding, of upholding the rights of minorities and fostering their interests. We can also point to the fact that no person is ever compelled to accept the faith of Baha'u'llah, and moreover, unlike the situation in certain other religions, each person has complete freedom to withdraw from the faith if he decides that he no longer believes in its founder or accepts its teachings. In light of these facts alone, it is evident that the growth of the Baha'i communities to the size where a non-Baha'i state would adopt this faith as the state religion, let alone to the point in which the state would accept that the law of God is its own law, and the National House of Justice as its legislature, must be a supremely voluntary and democratic process. I'm going to pause there for one second. It is difficult to actually see how much the Baha'i Faith upholds the rights of minorities, without actually again going into the statements of the central figures on this fact. But as well, so we have the protection of the rights of minorities enshrined within Baha'i writings. Secondly, they call attention to the fact that no one is compelled to accept the faith of Baha'u'llah and can leave at any time. This is what I meant earlier by an intentional community. You don't get dragged in to being a Baha'i. You must choose it, and we are not allowed to act, if you will, enact Baha'i laws on non-Baha'is. It also highlights the fact that the acceptance, as we see once again, of the Baha'i Faith as a state religion must be a supremely voluntary and democratic process chosen by the group who would then become the minority. So in a sense this won't happen unless it's handed over by the very people who would be the minorities. The, let the quote continues. As the Universal House of Justice wrote in its letter of 21st July 1968, to the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of the United States. It is not our purpose to impose Baha'i teachings upon others by persuading the powers that be to enact laws enforcing Baha'i principles, nor to join movements which have such legislation as their aim. The guidance of the Baha'i institutions offered to mankind does not comprise a series of specific answers to current problems, but rather the illumination of an entirely new way of life. Without this way of life, the problems are insoluble. With it, they will either not arise, or, if they arise, can be resolved. Two quotations from the writings of the Guardian can bear particularly on these principles of the rights and prerogatives of minorities and of individuals. In the Advent of Divine Justice is a passage which is of fundamental significance for Baha'i constitutional law. Quote, Unlike the nations and peoples of the earth, be they of the East or of the West, democratic or authoritarian, communist or capitalist, whether belonging to the old world or the new, who either ignore, trample on, or extirpate the racial, religious, or political minorities within the sphere of their jurisdiction, every organized community enlisted under the banner of Baha'u'llah should feel it to be its first an inescapable obligation to nurture, encourage, and safeguard every minority belonging to any faith, race, class, or nation within it. The House then says, As for the protection of the rights of individuals, there is the following translation of a forceful passage which appears in a letter from Shoghi Effendi to the Baha'is of Iran written in July 1925 in relation to a situation involving a covenant breaker. Quote, the mere act of disaffection, estrangement, or recantation of belief can in no wise detract from, or otherwise impinge upon, 
the legitimate civil rights of individuals in a free society, be it to the most insignificant degree. Were the friends to follow other than this course, it would be tantamount to a reversion on their part in this century of radiance and light to the ways and standards of a former age. They would reignite in men's breasts the fire of bigotry and blind fanaticism, cut themselves off from the glorious bestowals of this promised day of God, and impede the full flow of divine assistance in this wondrous age. There are so many aspects of this quote that we will have to go into again, as I said in the future. But what do we see? We see again, we cannot impose by teachings on others, by persuading governments to enact laws that would enforce by principles, nor join any movements that would have such legislation as their aim. We are trying to offer a new way of life, a new way of organizing society, a new way of interacting with institutions and the community at large. It is that which we are trying to do in our corner, if you will, to offer as a model to study for the world. We must actually do everything we can to, quote, safeguard every minority belonging to any faith, race, class, or nation within it. And if we actually move away from this principle, and it's important to note just how strong the statements here of the Guardian actually are, that if we were to actually move away from these, it would be a reversion on our part to the ways and standards of a former age. And what would we do? Reignite the fire of bigotry and flying, blind fanaticism. Cut ourselves off from the blood bestowals of this promised day of God. And impede the full flow of divine assistance in this wondered sage. That if we attempt to actually in any way trample upon the rights of minorities, we are really actually going against the very foundation of what Baha'u'llah has brought to humankind. In the end, this is why this is so pivotal that we not only understand better, all of us, better and better, the principles, one, of the non-involvement in politics, adhere to them as clearly as we possibly can, study the world order of Baha'u'llah to build it up, forgetting these other institutions, build it up as a model to present to humankind, right? Avoid any pressure that would seem to be bearing upon the governments of our day. Because we do not wish, if you, if you, as we have just heard, to in any way try to put pressure on them to institute policies and procedures. Or even engage with, if you will, movements who have legislation as their aim. That we are to stand aside and aloof, but stand up fully as Baha'is with a model to offer to humankind. That yes, this is a political plan, but it does not follow the ways that humankind have done this before. By pressuring people, using force, by trying to seize the reins of a government. No, we must stand aside, as pure as we can within the Baha'i writings themselves, to offer, if you will, a guiding light, so that others of their own free will can choose it. And not until those even who are not a part of the Baha'i cause itself, not until they choose to hand over the reins of power, will we ever cease to take it. And as we've seen even then, not until multiple countries do this, will even Baha'i states engage themselves in international political systems because of the nature of that contest for power and actually the acrimony can, that can often arise from it. I think this is made all the more important, once again, when we begin to look at the treatment of minorities underneath us. But more well, when we finally come to a place where we recognize, if you will, what it is that is actually being said. As I've stressed multiple times throughout this period, to really deeply understand what is actually being said that the world order Baha'u'llah is coming to be. So I have one final quote to read here. This here is from the World Order of Baha'u'llah, in the section, The Unfoldment of World Civilization. The revelation of Baha'u'llah, whose supreme mission is none other but the achievement of this organic, 
and spiritual unity of the whole body of nations should, if we be faithful to its implications, be regarded as signalizing, through its advent, the coming of age of the entire human race. It should be viewed not merely as yet another spiritual revival in the ever-changing fortunes of mankind, not only as a further stage in a chain of progressive revelations, nor even as the culmination of one of a series of recurrent prophetic cycles, but rather as marking the last and highest stage in the stupendous evolution of man's collective life on this planet. The emergence of a world community, the consciousness of world citizenship, the founding of a world civilization and culture, all of which must synchronize with the initial stages in the unfoldment of the Golden Age of the Baha'i Era, should by their very nature be regarded, as far as this planetary life is concerned, as the furthermost limits in the organization of human society. Though man as an individual will, they must indeed, as a result of such a consummation, continue indefinitely to progress and develop. That mystic, all-pervasive, yet indefinable change, which we associate with a stage of maturity inevitable in the life of the individual, and the development of the fruit must, if we would correctly apprehend the utterances of Baha'u'llah, have its counterpart in the evolution of the organization of human society. A similar stage must sooner or later be attained in the collective life of humankind, producing an even more striking phenomenon in world relations, and endowing the whole human race with such potentialities of well-being as shall provide throughout the succeeding ages the chief incentive required for the eventual fulfillment of its high destiny. Such a stage of maturity in the process of human government must, for all time, if we would be faithfully recognize the tremendous claim advanced by Baha'u'llah, remain identified with the revelation of which he was the bearer. This is one of the most striking passages I know of within the writings of the Guardian concerning the future world order. And it is this one section that should be viewed not merely as a spiritual, another spiritual revival. Not only that, not only as a further stage in a chain of progressive revelations, nor even as the culmination of a series of recurrent prophetic cycles. And I remember the first time I realized I was reading this, I noted that that was about as far as the limit as I had considered. But it says, but rather as marking the last and highest stage in the stupendous evolution of man's collective life on this planet. I'll leave that as a meditation for people to consider that intrinsic to the world order of Baha'u'llah as put forward in its political organization, in this transformation, in this offering of a new way of life to be considered by humankind, is the, if you will, the, the DNA of a world civilization that is the highest stage for planetary evolution politically that we can find. And I just offer that as a uh, enticing and very peculiar consideration for the friends as they move on. Thank you very much.